the Secretary of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches that had accomplished much. Former Director of the World Evangelical Association and the World Evangelical Fellowship. A world-class leader in his own state, but nevertheless, considering all these credentials, suppose na hinahangaan ko kay Doktor ay yung kanyang pagiging honest, open, and vulnerable. Nung makita ko yung buhay niya, there's something that had been fleshed out that I've seen as far as a certain leader is concerned. And my paradigm was shifted, and I know and I believe this is the real thing. No, ho. hindi para mihan ng alam, pagalingan ng pagsasalita lang, para mihan ng miembro o pakiutan, hindi kung gaano ka katutoo sa harapan ng Dios at ng tao. You are an authentic person. So praise God. Our speaker for today, more than anything else, is a person who is very much authentic. <laughs> considering all his credentials that he has done and accomplished for the glory of God. So without any further ado, let us welcome indeed Dr. Jun Denson. Come on. Clap and praise to the Lord. Amen. Thank you. After Listening to Bishop Vincent, I say amen to all that he said, and I feel that he has spoken for me already, and my job right now is to give the closing prayer. <laughs> Coming over here was, well, I always expect traffic in Metro Manila. Kaya yung isang ama papunta sa simbahan, when he was talking to his son, he made a turn, and he found out that it was a one-way, and he told his son, Son, I made a mistake, I made the wrong turn. And the son looked back, and he found out that there was a police car following them, and he said, Dad, you're all right. The police car also made the wrong turn. <laughs> I hope that you feel that happy to you that the policeman made the wrong turn as well. I renewed my driver's license in Iginto, a few days ago, and I faced one question about sight. I did not read the number correct. But sabi ko naman, bakit important yan? Alam naman natin yung mga Pilipino color line sa traffic. So pagkatakto lang naman yung color ng traffic light yung iba, red, green, and orange. Ang sa Pilipino, pagka green go, pagka orange, bilisan mo. Pagkaret, sige lang. Pagkaroon ka na. So, sabi ko, okay lang. Full of line naman tayo. But that is not necessarily the right argument, is it? I am so grateful that you have chosen the theme cutting edge. Others would say leading edge. And obviously, you are talking about the context where you can have a significant role in changing the context for good, for the Lord Jesus Christ in you. And so I'd like to congratulate you as well, and I add my own felicitations for you, that during this conference, you will hear the Word of God speak from the different speakers, and from your interaction with each other especially. But more than that, as we speak, I pray that you will have your pens, your notebooks, and your Bibles with you as well, so that when you go home, you have something to think about. There may be some concepts that you may find it difficult, but when you have them in your notes, you have an opportunity to double check, study it. There are Christian concepts that, to be very frank about it, I couldn't understand in my early Christian life. I have purchased book, could not understand altogether. But as I grow in my Christian life, I would look at the book, I open it up again, and all of a sudden it fits into the pattern that God does not give us all knowledge at the same time, but all knowledge are always incremental. So we build up our knowledge day after day until maturity sits in. Somebody said that there are four types of people in the world. 
The first step would be the man who knows and knows that he knows, he is wise. You consult him. The second type is the man who knows but doesn't know that he knows. Help him not to forget what he knows. And the third group of people are those who knows not and knows that he knows not, you teach him. And the fourth kind would be he who knows not but pretends that he knows, he is a fool, avoid him. So one way or the other you have to make a choice which uh, kind you are. In the last few years I have been deeply concerned about the cycling of the mind. Because it begins with the mind. If you can train your mind on the things that are of God, then your actions will most likely follow from what your mind tells you. Call well, that probably dreams if you would like to. But the Bible speaks about love him with all of your heart, soul, and mind as well. So we focus up in times on heart and soul. The spiritual as well as the emotional side of that, but the intellectual and mental side are often times forgotten. And in the world that we face today, we need more young people and leaders who will grapple with the theological, philosophical issues out there, because those issues in many ways confront the church, and if we are not careful, we will be seduced by these new isms around us and we may drift away from our spiritual lives. And so the discipling of the mind is very, very important. And this afternoon I may not be able to say anything new, but I will do review some of the things that you probably already know and perhaps amplify some of them. You know, when Vincent spoke about the future, let us bear in mind that the future belongs to the church, belongs to you and me. As a matter of fact, when you talk about the kingdom of God, the question that we ask is, if Jesus Christ is the president of the Philippines, how would the, president, how would the Philippines look like? If you talk about the, the cycling of the nations, how would we know that we are indeed the cycling of the nations? The fact is that when you become a Christian, the mark of change is inevitable. You cannot claim yourself to be a Christian and not change. The question about change is in what direction are you changing? What standard of change are you going to follow? It's not enough that you change. It must be biblical change. And let's put it this way. In the case of Isaiah, he said, when Jesus Christ will come again, and he will, he said, these are the marks of his kingdom. And his kingdom will be marked by righteousness. And if there is righteousness, follows justice. If there is justice, follows peace. And if there is peace, follows prosperity. But all these are the products of the fact that at the center of all these marks is a theocentric center that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior indeed. Now, the thing about Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 to 9 is simply this, that the language that Isaiah used is already in the past tense. As far as God is concerned, as far as Isaiah was concerned, these things are already done in the will of God. And that is why we are encouraged by that. We will undergo suffering. As a matter of fact, when we take a look at suffering, oftentimes we begin to doubt our faith. But the question that we ask is, is this, if God will give you suffering that he will not explain to you, will you still be committed to him? And I think many times we wish that we can understand everything, but that is an illusion. We cannot understand everything. But when he gives you suffering, and he will not explain why, will you still be committed to him? My family had undergone that recently, a lot of suffering. And the question is, should we remain loyal to him? And there is no choice actually for us. We believe with all of our heart that in that suffering one day, there will be redemption as well. So let me take a look at what I'd like to share with you. The first of that is, if we disciple the mind, it begins with the assurance that you truly believe in the God who exists. But it's only the belief that God exists, but who is the God who exists that you believe in and whose life you are entrusting to. 
The existence of God is the beginning of the discipling of the mind. Now, in Romans chapter 1, for example, theologians and apologists have given to us at least four such arguments for the existence of God. You see, the Bible does not give us a systematic apologetics for the existence of God. It does not say, if A is B and B is C, therefore God must be C. Okay, it doesn't say that. But there are certain theological statements and philosophical ones of that that will demonstrate to us that the God that we believe also exists. The first of that is the argument by design, causation, the cosmological argument. Paul said, look around you. What is invisible is made visible by the creative things that you have seen in creation itself. In other words, when you see things as they are in the world today, you cannot help but ask the question, how did they come to be? And therefore, nothing happens without a cause. And that sense, that is the basis of our cosmological argument. Everything around you, as Psalm 8 and, Psalm, and the other Psalms as well testify, God exists because the moon, the stars, creation around you declares the glory of the Lord. And the second part of that is design, the argument by design. In other words, if you take a look at the design of creation itself, the design of your human body, the design of beauty around you, you must ask yourself the question, who is the grand architect of all these things? When you see a beautiful building, you cannot just say, well, this just happened. You ask the question, who designed it? And therefore, when you take a look at the beauty of creation itself, you cannot help but ask the question, who designed it? Okay. Sabi nga ni Vincent, eh, hindi daw siya guwapo. So, tatanungin niya ang Panginoon, why did you design me the way I am? Eh, bakit yung siya guwapo ako hindi? Relative yun. Sa mata ni Sister Ligaya, si Vincent ang pinakagwapong lalaki sa mundo. Hindi po ba? Alright, so it's a relative thing. Uh, I can say, my wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. Then, you will disagree with me because you'll say, no, 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 that's not true. My wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. And so you can only say, my wife is the most beautiful woman in the world next to yours. And then that is acceptable, right? So, design is part of that. The third of that is the moral argument. A lot of people are saying that there can be no God because sufferings and evil exist in the world. There's so much wrong in the world today. But unknowingly, the moment you post it something like there is evil in the world, there is badness in the world, you also assume the other side of it. There can be no bad without good. And so when you assume bad and good, you cannot help but say, therefore there must be a law that defines bad and good. And if there is a law that defines bad and good, good, then the next question is, who is the one who made the law? And so you argue about the law giver that gives us the law that determines the absolute standard of what is right and what is wrong. And that argues for us strongly as well. And the fourth of that is simply saying that there is the argument of what they call that as ontological, meaning you know that there is God, all right? You don't have any proof. You know that deep in you there is God who created you. And that's why even in Romans chapter 4, 14 and following, the Bible simply says that those who do not have the law have the law in them because God has written it in their heart. In other words, whether you like it or not, there is a sense in which you believe that God exists. You know it. In intuitively, you know it. And when you take a look at the world today, wherever you go, people worship an idol. And they presuppose that there is a a transcendent being that they can worship that is the source of everything else that they believe. So when we talk about ontology, we are saying that, yeah, instinctively, intuitively, I know that there is God. Sabi nga nila, there are no atheists in the foxhole. I mean, if you are in danger, you pray, right? If you are in danger, you pray. But if you are doing well, you forget about God. And that is what is happening in our world today for the past many centuries. We keep on talking about prosperity. I was talking to someone last night, and she was saying, well, we believe that prosperity is coming to the Philippines. I said, yeah, that is good. That is good. 
But the question is, the degree of prosperity is also a disparity. Because some people are more prosperous than the others. How many families own the nation? Now, the other side about that is this. When you talk about prosperity, then learn from, you, from history. People are prosperous only to become idolatrous. So there's also a danger to that that we have to balance. And one thing, my friend, is this. Do not get out of the framework that God expects you to earn, but at the same time, not to hoard your earning. You are to share that earning with those who are needy as well. When you as professionals work, then you must understand that your earnings must go to your family primarily, then it must go to your church, then it must go to your taxes, then it must go to the others who are needy as well. You don't earn just for yourself. And that's part of the problem that Christians are facing today. We begin to talk about Psalm 73 without realizing that the joy and the happiness of a person is not defined by the amount of bank account that he has. Our joy is found in the peace that comes only from Jesus Christ and the assurance that God will take care of all our needs. In the song you have said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and some will be given to you. Some or all will be given to you. All will be added to you. Now, you might say, well, there are disparities of wealth among the Christians themselves. Well, I don't know why. But that's also the scale of the economy. Not all of us have the same level of competencies to be productive. And therefore, the result of our differences in competencies will also result in differences in the scale of our economy. But one thing is certain, God wants us and his people to enjoy everything that God wants them to enjoy. All right. So there, there is that argument from Scripture itself. The only problem really is this. The arguments that we have heard are in many ways incomplete. For example, if there's good and evil, if there is good and bad, there must be a law that determines good and bad. Then if there is a law, then who is the lawgiver? And then we jump into the conclusion that the lawgiver is God. But that is not warranted by the syllogism. We just say, okay, so everything else is beautiful. There is a designer and the designer is God. But there is no warrant that the designer is God. We jump into the conclusion and you can argue more and more along those lines. I think you can argue well as well that the, eventually the point of God. But I think there is one argument that we call the threshold of infinity. The threshold of infinity. Now, put it this way. When you talk about integers, you begin with zero, and you count onward, and the first integer is one, two, three, four, five. Now, where, where will it end? What is the final number when you keep on counting onward? Do you know? All right, do you know? And the answer is infinity. You keep on counting one, and so on, you will not end counting infinity. That's why this is the threshold of infinity. Now, from zero, you count backward. From zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. Or I keep on counting backward, where will it end? So when you begin counting backward, you have only two options. One is that it continues counting. But if you continue counting into infinity, then why are you counting from one? Because technically you have not started yet. You follow me? If you keep on counting minus one and so on, it will be in infinity. So how can you say one, two, and three? Because you have not started counting yet, because you are still moving backward. So what is the option there for? The next option is that we count backward, but there is a point of beginning. And the point of beginning is God, the first cause of everything else. And so you argue that God is the first cause, and therefore you develop your argument along those lines. Now, you have two options. Keep on counting for infinity, and the question is, why did you arrive where you are right now? Because technically, you should not have arrived because you're still counting backward. So the other option is, you started somewhere. And the Bible speaks about, in the beginning, God. And therefore, we start with that statement. In the beginning, God. The question is, 
How would we know that God exists the way we understand it, the way Bible speaks about God? Now, you talk about the concept of source and issue. I am a father, and therefore, my issue are my children. But when you look at my children, they carry some of my characteristics as well. Sometimes they look at me, they, they look like me, others they think like me, but some of our characteristics are passed on to our children. Source and issue. God is the source, and we are the issue, and we represent the characteristics of God himself, the source of our being. And that's why he said we are created in the image of God, and that image is in us as well. But the other side about that is something else. When you really think about source and issue, we are given by the reality that if you keep on looking back, who are you? Now, human beings would have rationality. That's number one. We all are rational beings, all right? We, we are capable of reasoning out, of understanding our surroundings. The second part about that, we have life. The third thing is that we have consciousness. We are aware of our relationship. We are aware of things around us. We are aware of everything that takes place around us. And then there's the concept of thought. The concept of the idea of like liberty, justice. Why do we understand these concepts and attach meaning to them? Reason. Then there is the self, the I, the me, and the mind. Someone said, I think, therefore I am. But the philosophical question is, who is the I? I think, therefore I am. So when you come to think about rationality, life, consciousness, thought, self, these are possessed by all of us as human beings. Where did we get that? And so if we believe that God created us, then the God that we worship must be personal. He must also have this characteristic. He has rationality, he has life, he has consciousness, he has thought, he, ha he is the very God himself. And so we can say that, okay, we can identify the beginning of our existence, God himself, because he has all these characteristics that are unique to those of us who believe that we came from the source of God. And even scientists cannot, cannot contradict these concepts. This was created by Roy Abraham Bergasi. You know, in the past many years, one of the worst atheists in the world was Anthony Flew. Now, he was with a group of C.S. Lewis, but somehow C.S. Lewis became an apologist for the pro-Christ, right? but Anthony Flew was always against the existence of God. But the argument of Bergasi compelled him to believe that there is God because of this reality. And of course, the final argument that God exists is Jesus Christ himself. In other words, Jesus Christ and his resurrection is the final proof of the existence of God. Because you cannot disprove that Jesus Christ was a historical figure, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead, never to die again. The fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead as he said he would, demonstrates that he is the Son of God. You must understand that in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ at least five times said that the proof that I am the Son of God, that I am the very God himself, is my resurrection. Now, if you tell me today that I will die on a Friday and I want you to bury me immediately and then on a Sunday come to my graveyard because I will rise again from the dead, who do you think will be there? Will your wife be there? Why? Because the universal experience is that once you are dead, you are dead, period. And there's only one man who has broken that, that reality. He died, he rose again from the dead. And then there's a significant why Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He did not only rise from the dead because he is the Son of God, but he rose from the dead to continue his work of ensuring that you and I will complete our own journey with him and eventually be glorified also. So he died at the cross that you might be saved, but he rose again that he might continue to guide us by his spirit in order that we can complete the run of life and will eventually be with him in heaven as well. Now the second thing that I'd like to share with you today is the sovereignty of God. Nangyari kasi sa eleksyon na lahat na lang sovereignty of God. 
comes are divided on the side. There are those who believe that God is sovereign, therefore he appoints kings and presidents and all that. And there are those who believe that the sovereignty of God must be expressed in terms of justice uh, and peace, all right? So if, for example, one party says, this party is not just, then it cannot be the sovereignty of God. Well, I don't know about that. My point simply is this. God is sovereign. He is in control. And the concept of sovereignty is both authority and power. God is the author of everything in the universe. Therefore, he has the right to do whatever he wants with his own creation itself. So God is sovereign. He permits everything to happen. He did not decree everything to happen, but he permits everything to happen. Because if there is any power at all that can hinder the power of God, then eventually it's not sovereign anymore. All right? So, let me put it this way. The problem of sovereignty is always dealing with the freedom of a person, free will. My free will die, therefore, how can God be sovereign over us? If God is sovereign and we are not free, then who are we? If we are free but we can control God, our actions are outside of his permission, then he is not sovereign at all. So somewhere in time there are sense in which we affirm all that. And not only that, if God is not sovereign, there is no guarantee that his promises in the Bible he will fulfill. The only reason na niwala tayo na ang mga parako ng Panginoon sa Biblia ay matutupad sapagkat ang Diyos ay makapangyarihan sa lahat. Kung hindi siya makapangyarihan sa lahat, anong guarantee natin na ang mga pangako niya ay matutupad? We have no basis to trust the Bible anymore. We have no basis in fact to trust Him. And that's why very important for us to recognize that all these are important in the developing of our mind. So, pagkat yung sovereignty at human freedom, apat lang ang choice po dyan. Number one, God could provide everyone an opportunity to be saved. Alright, so God can provide everyone dito an opportunity to be saved. That's the first option. The second option is this. God can provide everyone the opportunity to be saved. Huh? Opportunity to be saved. The third is, God could intervene directly and ensure the salvation of all the people. And number four, God could intervene directly and ensure the salvation of some people. Now the question is, what do we believe as evangelicals? Now, if you believe that God will provide everyone no, oppor no opportunity for salvation, then we are in trouble. Because nobody can be saved. The question is, God could provide everyone the opportunity to be saved, but the question is, who we believe? Alright? The Bible says that no one is seeking God. So, if God says, I provide an opportunity for you to be saved, who can be saved and who can turn to God? The Bible said, no one seeks God. We are all sinners. And because sinners, we are rebels. And so left on our own, will you turn to God? On the other hand, if God will ensure that we all will be saved, then how can you deal with the fact that not all wants to be saved or want to turn to Jesus Christ? Therefore, you see, God is coercing your mind to believe Him. And if God coerces your mind to believe in Him, then how can He be the God who created us with a free will? We have no more free will in that sense. Now He said, but I have created the opportunity for some to be saved, that some might be saved. Now that's a very hard thing to swallow, but the fact is that you have to make your option. And I personally believe that without the intervention of God, because we are all sinners and no one is Seeking God, no one can be saved. And by God's grace, He intervened. But the problem is, He intervened, but He did not save all, He only saved some. And the question is, are you in the sum? Naniwala pa kayo nakasama kayo sa sum are saved? Are you sure? But by the grace of God, he is saying, 
that I am saving some in Christ Jesus. It's a part of, but that is a reality. Now, if we take a look, therefore, at the, the sovereignty of God, now, on one hand, we believe that God is saying that whoever is the heads of our country, we must pray and support him. On the other hand, God is also saying that we must fight for justice and peace and righteousness. So the two must be combined. The two cannot be separated. It's not an either or. It's simply the fact that we must continue to pursue peace and justice because that is the end that God wants his people to enjoy. And then the third thing that I'd like to talk to you about is the love of God. Oh, by the way, in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has two instruments, the church on one hand and the state on the other hand, okay? The church on one hand, tayo, and primary function at it is to pray for all people and those in authority. And number two is to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaim justification by faith. That is our primary role. On the case of the state, the primary role is to promote justice and peace in our society. Okay. So, the question therefore the church is, if we continue proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are creating born-again citizens who will be, who have greater chances of promoting peace and justice in the land. That is why the church is to be supported by the types of its people, while the state is to be supported by the taxes of its people. Now, the church is not the kingdom of God, to be equated in the kingdom of God, but the church is the primary manifestation of the kingdom of God and the primary agent for the proclamation of the kingdom of God. May makasabihan na, kung there is justice and peace, then the kingdom of God is there. In other words, the kingdom of God is larger than the church. But the church is the best expression of the kingdom of God in our world today. Now the third thing I'd like to talk to you about is the love of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world he gave. Now, the one thing we need to review is the question, why did God become man? See, I was talking to our board in Get in mind that the year 312 is a very important year in human history, particularly for the church. In the year 312, persecution of the Christians in Rome stopped altogether. Why? Because Constantine became emperor and he stopped the persecution. So all of a sudden, the Christians are no longer persecuted. They could worship God, but the worst have happened. Far worse than persecution. Instead of persecution, there was heresy. And one of those heresies says that Jesus Christ is not really human, is not really God. In other words, he cannot save us. So the question for us today is that, why is it that Jesus Christ is God who became man? What is the purpose of that for your salvation and my salvation? Why could he not just come as a man, but not God? Why could he not just come as God, but not as man? And the simple reason for that is because all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. Therefore, for us to be saved, someone must die.